to introduce our speaker today. Hugo Samianto is an assistant professor at Columbia GSAP. His research critically examines the relationship between planning for climate change, natural disasters, and spatial inequalities, such as housing deficits, poor infrastructure, and racial segregation. Specifically, it considers how these inequalities contribute to the social production of risk and vulnerability. To that end, he relies on political economy and comparative research to investigate emerging climate change adaptation and post-disaster recovery strategies. Central to his research agenda is considering the social mobilization, grassroots, resistance, and counter-planning efforts which shape these strategies. Hugo has a special interest in Latin American urban geographies, having completed projects in Brazil, Colombia, El Salvador, Gua Guatemala, and Mexico. His most recent research has focused on the relocation and displacement of communities vulnerable to flooding in Colombian cities. Currently, he's also studying post-disaster recovery and community relocation efforts in Puerto Rican coastal communities. Before joining GSAP, Hugo was an assistant professor at the UIUC in the Department of Planning, or Urban and Regional Planning, and he has received his PhD at the U University of California, Los Angeles in the Department of Urban Planning. Professor Sarmiento's talk today is entitled Reframing Climate Justice in San Diego de Cali, Afro-Columbian Resistance to Climate Relocation, which examines how San Diego de Cali's um, Proyecto Plan Jardilin, a project to upgrade cities, um, the city's flooding protection system, which includes Latin America's largest resettlement project. The study found the city's failure to account for the segregation of black residents in high risk areas has led to resistance, conflict, and delays in the completion of the project. The resistance and set of demands asserted by black residents are transforming Colombia's climate policy and creating new forms and approaches to adaptation planning. So Professor Samianto, whenever you're ready, I'll pass things over to you now. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that introduction, Helena. I'm, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay, good. Okay, um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Hugo Sarmiento. I'm an assistant professor in urban planning here at GSAP. And the title of my talk is Reframing Climate Justice in Santiago de Cali, a study of Afro-Colombian resistance to climate relocations. Uh, Santiago de Cali is Colombia's third largest and fastest growing city. Um, and like many other cities in the global south, it's experimenting with climate adaptation strategies. Um, what I want to emphasize today is that these cities do so in very highly contested social and cultural terrains. This constatation is often reflected in spatial conflicts, such as land disputes, exclusion from formal housing markets, and residential segregation in high-risk areas. Now, the growing research literature on climate adaptation also reveals that insofar as it advances existing development pathways, adaptation carries with it the potential for reproducing these conflicts in cities. However, in its attempt to build a broad conceptual framework that explains the urban nature of climate adaptation, it has yet to historicize and to connect more deeply with the particular social and cultural geographies which condition these interventions. Therefore, less is known about the role of historically excluded and oppressed communities, the role they can play in shaping climate adaptation in cities uh, through acts of resistance and counterplanning. This study uh, examines such a community. It examines how Afro-Colombian communities in Cali are shaping the city's Project Plan Harion, a large scale infrastructure project to upgrade the city's levy and flood protection system. Now, I will begin uh, with the theory guiding this study. Um, so, social ecological systems theory, um, the dominant paradigm in the study of climate adaptation, conceptualizes risk and hazards as external to social systems. Therefore, social elites can very comfortably mobilize the language of social ecological systems theory, resilience, adaptive capacity, without having to address the underlying asymmetries in political and economic power, which determine how risk is produced and experienced by these communities. 
Political economy as an alternative locates risk inside social systems, in the political, economic, and historical processes that place individuals and groups at risk through spatial exclusion and restrictions on their mobility. Now, the origins of climate risk from this perspective, therefore, lie just as much in the lack of access to credit and housing market as it does in extreme weather events. Importantly, a sustained focus on the political economy of climate risk moves us away from discussions of conservation, of resource management, and resilience, and opens new lines of inquiry, which critically examine the social factors which interact with natural ecosystems to produce risk. A political economy requires specific analytical approaches. The scholarship needs to stay attentive to histories of conflict, oppression, and resistance. In the urban context, a good place to look is at the housing markets and housing policy. It can help us understand how social environmental relationships have been formed historically and why certain spatial patterns of risk, such as racial segregation, persist. This brings into view the social terrains of struggle in which adaptation experiments are taking place. And most importantly, how social actors who are largely absent from the policy debates over the climate crisis can draw on historical traditions of resistance to contest adaptation policy. With this analytical approach in mind, the study is guided by the following questions. What is the political and economic basis of Afro-Colombian resistance to Plan Harillon's housing and relocation strategy? How has the Afro-Colombian resistance shaped these adaptation strategies? Now, a quick note here, uh, climate adaptation in Cali, again, Colombia's third largest and fastest growing city, is viewed as a strategic intervention with regional and national implications. The city occupies a pivotal node in transportation networks near one of Colombia's most important points of connection to global trade, the Buenaventura port on the Pacific coast, cities located approximately 50 miles from the coast, and manufacturing and agricultural centers in the Cauca Valley. Uh, so protecting Cali from climate disasters uh, then is understood as a critical investment in Colombia's future economic development. And for this reason, the city partnered uh, with hydrological engineering experts from Holland, uh, Royal Haskinen, to perform flood simulations that factored in climate model projections. And you can see that simulation here in the map on the left. Um, the, the risk assessment based on this simulation found that in a worst case scenario, um, nearly uh, 1 million or more specifically 900,000 residents out of 2 million uh, could be affected by catastrophic flooding. 75% of residents could lose access to potable water for up to four months um, as, as a consequence of uh, incapacitated water treatment plants uh, that are currently found in the floodplain. And the city uh, could potentially incur damages of approximately 4 billion US dollars. Now, based on this assessment, um, the city uh, found that it would require uh, a huge investment in reinforcing the levy and flood protection system that protects uh, residents from catastrophic flooding. Okay, so this economic imperative uh, motivates the city to partner with national actors such as uh, Fondo, Ad Fondo Adaptación. Uh, Fondo Adaptación um, is a national entity that was created in the aftermath of a series of catastrophic winter storms in 2011. Um, and I will say more about Fondo Adaptación, but for now, the important uh, thing is that Fondo Adaptación and Cali have created a partnership to invest in protect protective infrastructure 
and the city's technical capacity for disaster risk management. And the, the project I'm uh, highlighting today is called Project Juan Harillon. Um, again, this involves the reinforcement of about 26 uh, kilometers of the city's flood protection system. Um, most importantly here is that it requires the relocation of 8,700 households uh, to complete the reinforcement. Now this relocation project represents the largest of its type in Latin America. The city uh, presents these relocations as an opportunity, as an economic opportunity and as a social opportunity to reverse segregation. However, the project has generated contentious debate and at times violent conflict over the relocation of residents at project sites. Now, unlike Bogota and Medellin, the, other, the, the two other principal cities in Colombia, Bogota being the capital and Medellin uh, being one of the most well-known cities in Latin America for its pioneering and innovative uh, urban experiments. Unlike these cities, Cali lacks a resettlement policy for disaster risk management and still lacks the institutional mechanisms and financial tools required for relocation. And so it partnered um, with Plan Harillon, um, which is uh, Fonda Aplacion's project in Cali, to create new housing and compensation strategies for the relocation of residents. And through this partnership, uh, Cali has improvised a combination of buyouts, subsidies, and housing vouchers, and res rental assistance to address the severe housing deficit that's experienced by residents at project sites. Early in the project, um, Plan Harillon uh, exhausted the supply of, of social housing um, in Cali. Um, this nece necessitated a turn to market-based strategies for the relocation process. And this shift in strategy generated a great deal of uncertainty for residents as it pushed them into the open market, which historically has excluded them through a process of racial stigmatization um, and segregation. So initially, Plan Harion was able to resettle families in existing social housing projects, most of which were built by national housing uh, programs. So they pre-existed this intervention. But when these projects reached capacity, the city had to offer temporary rental assistance while it worked to fast track the construction of new social housing projects. But the city has struggled to build new housing. Um, so residents uh, find themselves renting for prolonged undefined periods. Eventually, the city created a new mode of compensation, a new mode of relocation, housing vouchers, um, which residents can use to find their own permanent housing solution in the open market. Now, this approach is complicated by high levels of informality at project sites. Therefore, it has been uneven and consistent, uh, creating uncertainty for residents and ultimately delays for the project. So located in the city's eastern, eastern periphery, this area has been largely beyond the reach of Cali's urban planning. The residents here have been historically excluded from the formal housing market, and they've bridged this deficit through informal housing, which you see here. Housing is a poor quality uh, in poor infrastructure. What's important to note in these images is that this development pattern has produced a complex environment of mixed urban and rural uses and diverse land tenure arrangements. So for example, new surveys uh, conducted by Plan Harion found residents living in multi-story homes located next to single family homes with large lots dedicated to a combination of agricultural uses and small scale manufacturing and even recycling plants. And in some cases, neighborhoods straddle publicly and privately owned land. This complex environment presents a, a very difficult challenge for Plan Harillon and its use of these uh, relocation uh, subsidies, which, which are premised on property ownership and establishing clear property rights. And finally, um, the residents in these communities are heavily st stigmatized 
they've been branded as, as criminals, as engaged in illegal activity, and a very common term across Colombia and Latin America as a land invasion, as invaders uh, in the city. Still, uh, I would argue Plan Harjón's most pronounced challenge has been negotiating the racial exclusion and segregation of Cali's of Black residents. The segregation of Black residents has been largely invisible in formal city plans. Um, identified in the census as Afro-Columbians, uh, Black residents in Cali officially make up about 30% of the city's two and a half million residents. Um, these are residents who migrated to the city from Colombia's Pacific Coast region, which is colloquially known as El Pacifico. And since the 1990s, the city has followed a pattern of rapid urbanization, in which Black residents have been excluded by the housing market and segregated in the informal settlements, which concentrate in the floodplains of the eastern urban periphery. Now, the expansion of these settlements uh, in these areas is driven by the new residents who migrated uh, from the Pacific Coast um, as a result of uh, being internally displaced by political and economic violence uh, in the region. So when you look at these maps, uh, the analysis of Black residential patterns reveals that they generally match the spatial distribution of risk in the city. That is, Black residents are overrepresented in areas of the city with the highest risk of not only chronic flooding, but also landslides. Now, this disproportionate exposure to risk experienced by Black residents in Cali is ex exacerbated by the informality which characterizes development in these areas. Now, the city measures the distribution of social vulnerability factors that are closely associated with informal development, uh, such as inadequate housing conditions, a lack of basic services, uh, and sanitation, and low income status, which you can see uh, mapped out in the third map here on the slide. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna go back here to Fondo Adaptación, the national entity that the city has partnered with uh, to execute this project. Fondo Adaptación is very much a part of what critical scholars call uh, the resilience industrial complex. Um, now, the resilience industrial complex is reflected in the emergence of adaptation and resilience as a hegemonic development discourse circulated by national and international development agencies, including banks, which finance development and local actors such as municipal governments. It's important here is that the complex circulates models of urban resilience driven by investment imp imperatives and notions of best practices in international development. And through this process of mobilizing and imposing uniform models that are typically designed in cities like New York City and Washington DC, through this process, um, what, what the complex is doing is erasing local histories, erasing local cultures through a process of homo homogenizing. Um, you can see here, for example, in the image, uh, Fundaptacion's, uh, their flagship project uh, called Gramalote, um, which was the reconstruction of an entire town in, in a mountainous region of Colombia. Um, you see here the design uh, represents a very uniform uh, model that's alien uh, to Colombia. It's also important to note that Fundación recently partnered with the World Bank um, to finance this type of resilient infrastructure and housing across Colombia. So Fundación funds the construction of public housing projects such as this one that's part of Plan Harrión. Um, and very comfortably uses the language of resilience in its discourse. Um, so for example, here, this project is uh, presented as adapted housing. Um, 
What they don't show and what it obscures is the conflict and violence embedded in these projects. The acts of displacement and dispossession uh, required to build these towers and a rupturing uh, of traditional forms of housing in the, these areas of the city. That's because the discourse of climate adaptation and resilience fits well within the dominant paradigms of international development, which promote older, more established discourses, such as community engagement and inclusion. Fondatación imports all of the latest techniques of inclusive development. So here uh, we see a capacity building workshop in Cali. And this development, has be, development uh, form has become proficient at creating and using techniques which ostensibly engage communities, but do not necessarily alter political asymmetries. Uh, so inclusion can be defined in terms of capacity building and the mobilizing of existing social and cultural capital in communities. It may even include borrowing of culture to innovate new forms of adaptation. However, none of this involves changing the asymmetries which mediate social and environmental relationships as expressed in these development techniques. It simply enables them in a more efficient form. So critical scholars like Harriet Bukele argue these experiments can be viewed as political performances in which urban regimes deploy a set of discourses to normalize and stabilize new forms of hegemony. Now, through this process, uh, Fondaptacion has found a willing partner in Kali's uh, leaders. Now, uh, during the study period, community resistance to the project was met with forced evictions and at times violent police incursions. C city leaders, despite being legally obligated to offer housing alternatives to residents, justified these forced evictions on the basis that residents in these informal settlements constituted a risk to the rest of the city. They reasoned these informal settlements contribute to the deterioration of the levy system and stand in the way of the city's attempt to perform upgrades. Therefore, the forced evictions were necessary to protect the city from the risk of flooding. So rhetorically, what they're doing is that they are shifting the blame and the creation of risk to the residents of the Harriam. However, Black residents have resisted the city's relocation efforts by recentering public debate on demands for racial and cultural recognition. They have, in effect, introduced a history of racial oppression in Colombia into the climate change discussion. Now, they've done this by counterplanning and asserting alternative culture based forms of territorial planning through the creation of community councils known as Consejos Comunitarios, Ancestrales. These community councils uh, served as the organizational basis for the social mobilization and coordination between the communities impacted by Plan Harrio. It's important to note that uh, Consejos Comunitarios are a legal artifact of the Colombian constitution. Um, they are recognized as a political entity based on an ethnic minority's right to make territorial claims. Um, this includes asserting political autonomy and territorial sovereignty over lands that they have histo inhabited historically. That is, the con this constitutional right is meant to protect ethnic minorities, um, their cultural practices, governance, and legal structures and traditional place-based economic practices such as fishing, sand mining, and agriculture. However, most legally recognized community councils in Colombia are rural and indigenous. So for Black communities threatened by Plan Harillon in the urban context, uh, gaining legal rec recognition as a community council has often involved boundary disputes with the city. This is because they live in an informal settlement where legal boundaries uh, are unclear. So communities might claim a historical tie to their territory along with cultural traditions 
and custom specific to Afro-Colombians from the Pacific region. But the city counters that these lands uh, exist within municipal boundaries and therefore belong to the public at large. For the city, recovery of these lands through forced evictions constitutes a restitution of public property. Now, a key to the community resistance uh, strategy has been the creation of counter narratives, which emphasize a cultural practice of living near bodies of water. They claim a proficiency in alternative forms of managing risk of flooding and, and frame their presence as environmental stewards. These narratives are embedded in the Pacific region's unique Afro-Colombian culture. So these new residents have fundamentally shaped the city's social and cultural terrain forming in Cali what is co colloquially known as the Pacifico Urbano or the urban Pacific. Uh, an integral part of this culture is a tradition of living in close proximity to coastal and uh, riverine environments. The community councils have created new discursive, discursive symbols that emphasize this territorial identity. So for example, here you see a mural in uh, La Playa Renaciente um, in Cali. Uh, it's a very um, uh, emblematic cultural symbol uh, meant to preserve the community's collective memory and identity. They have also created cultural practices such as um, the Guardia Cimarronas, which in English is Cimarron Guards. Um, these guards are the community council's uh, principal organizing instrument. Um, they have consisted of approximately 20, 25 residents uh, who organize themselves to resist the city's intrusions into a community's territory. Um, in practice, uh, they have functioned more as symbols of resistance and the primary vehicle for showing solidarity between communities. So when one community is threatened by evictions, community guards from across the levy mobilize to resist. Um, the leader from uh, a community called Brisas explained that community guards were modeled after those created by indigenous communities in the Cauca Valley. She explained, we studied the history of the Black Cimarrones the Black communities who did not want to be enslaved, they would escape and form their own territories, they called Palenques. White people could not go to Palenques because they were independent. That's where the idea of the guard comes from. Uh, she explained that the staff you see the residents holding here is not to fight someone, uh, it represents peace. What we are saying with this staff is, you bring violent arms, uh, but not us. This is our territory, let's establish a dialogue. I wanted to share a video with you all, but this is not working. <laughs> so I'll just talk about it. Um, so uh, the resistance has taken uh, various forms. Uh, We've adopted uh, social movement tactics, organizing mass public protests, um, where they, they were able to bring the public's attention to the violence they experienced during forced evictions. They have also engaged uh, local electoral politics, uh, foreign political parties and participating in elections. And while individual communities have, have had varying levels of, of success in resisting displacement, through their collective efforts, they were able to shift the debate from one centered on climate risk to one centered on cultural recognition, racial justice, and access to decent housing. It's important to, to clarify that the objective of the resistance is not necessarily to stay in these communities, but more so to remove the stigma and to set the terms for discussion and planning of their relocation. This resistance is shaping Colombian policy, Colombian climate adaptation 
uh, planning and practices. Um, the resistance has won uh, some of these communities legal recognition as sovereign Afri afro colombian communities. Uh, one of the most important outcomes of this recognition is that it makes possible legal claims on territory and the right to decent housing, in particular, a process known as prior consultation, in which the city is legally obligated to meet the community members and uh, coll co collaboratively uh, create a plan for their collective relocation to a location of their choosing. So uh, where you before had individual subsidies and housing vouchers, um, now the, the city and the Fondatación uh, created a new uh, instrument uh, and a new uh, pathway um, on the basis of collective subsidies, and that is housing cooperatives, where the community working with the city partner with private developers to identify um, a location for their resettlement. Another result of the resistance has been to create new points of entry. Um, here, uh, the city created something they call the Guardians of the Levy. Um, this can be understood as a new structure for governance. Um, and um, it, it also represents the city's uh, uh, adaptation uh, and co-opting uh, co of the language um, that community residents have created. Uh, these guardians are meant to play an important role in educating residents of the importance in environmental stewardship. Now, so finally, I want to conclude with uh, a couple of comments here that while these gains uh, are important to, to, to be recognized, um, they also should be qualified by their tenuous nature. Um, Plan Harion is still not complete. To date, it is still not clear yet where communities are gonna be relocated or resettled. Moreover, the, the gardens of the levee, which I just showed you, mainly involve residents who live in the surrounding communities, not those in the levee itself. And it is not known exactly what role they will play once the project is fully complete. More generally, most importantly, the structural racism um, that explains the segregation is still very deeply embedded in the city's social spatial terrain. Segregation, discrimination, and informality continue to be a challenge. Black residents continue to be disproportionately represented in floodplains um, where they are at high risk of flooding disasters. Still, this case uh, provides evidence that moving beyond systems thinking and foregrounding the highly cont contested social and cultural terrains in which urban climate adaptation projects take place allows us to better understand how racial segregation and exclusion alters social environmental relationships. More importantly, it brings into view how social actors might shape um, urban adaptation through acts of resistance. And I will stop, I will stop there. Great, that was a fantastic lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Sarmiento for your talk. Um, I would like to open up the session for questions now. Um, just as a reminder again, to ask questions, participants on Zoom may raise, uh, are encouraged to use the raise your hand feature. And I'll call on you to unmute and you can ask your question directly. Or you may also type your question in the chat box and I can read them out. Um, Uh, yes, Bernadette. Uh, Bernadette, you can unmute and ask a question. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sarmiento, for such an interesting talk. And I think it provokes us as planners and as experts or as people 
who operate across multiple systems and communities to think differently in so many ways, or at least it did for me. Um, I had kind of a big question and a small question. The big question is what is special about housing? Can you, I was feeling that you were saying it throughout, but what is different necessarily about housing? And how is it different in the, in the, through the lens of race in the Afro-Colombian uh, communities? as opposed to other forms of infrastructure or services or, or things that are owned um, in, that, are, that, are, that need to adapt or that are threatened by uh, climate change. Um, and a small question is, in the processes of consultation that were developed um, or that, now have, that are now uh, newly being instated, are there intermediaries and are, who are they hired by? And who is, who's talking in those processes? And how, yeah, so, and just thank you again. It's really got me thinking in so many ways about everything. Okay. Um, Elena, should I answer that question or are we, am I, are we taking questions? How, what is the process? Um, yeah, you can, you can answer that question and then we'll just uh, let the next person ask it after you respond. Okay. Um, so what is special about housing? That's uh, a, a very good question. Um, and um, well, I would argue that exclusion from the housing market is one of the main uh, factors that contributes to risk um, in Latin America. And so um, a, a typical, uh, the, the typical uh, pattern of urban development in, in Latin America involves um, an, a, a formally planned core surrounded by rings of informal development. Um, and that, that sort of spatial configuration very uh, visibly and clearly represents the exclusion from the housing market. And so these informal settlements are constructed in areas of the city uh, uh, that are especially vulnerable to, the, to risks such as landslides, flooding, um, and you add to that the poor infrastructure or the lack of infrastructure, and you have um, an, an especially physically vulnerable uh, community. Um, so housing is paramount. It's central to any adaptation strategy. Um, the second point about race, um, race is an interesting question in Latin America because, um, you know, there is this kind of um, uh, well, uh, we, we might be inclined to kind of to, to impose our no notions of racial segregation and racial identity in the United States um, in the Latin American context. Um, that would be a mistake. There, there's a unique history behind uh, racial formation and identity in Latin America. Um, so it, it's, you can't sort of simply take the racial segregation that defines American cities um, and, and superimpose that on the Latin American context. Um, but nevertheless, race is a critical factor in explaining segregation and social spatial patterns in Latin American cities. Um, in the case of Cali, um, this is very clear. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, Cali still does not have formal policy or plans for these, partic for these specific residents. Um, and, um, you know, th these are residents that experience discrimination in the housing market. Um, so the strategy that I talked about uh, of giving them housing vouchers to go out into the open market to find their own housing alternatives is problematic because now they, they have to deal and negotiate with this discrimination and exclusion, um, which is the very reason why they turn to informal settlements. Um, so race is critical here. Um, now I focused here on Afro-Colombian residents, but this is a multicultural environment. Um, the other big uh, community here are indigenous uh, residents in this valley. Um, and they have also experienced exclusion um, and oppression. Um, and so uh, what, what you see here in these uh, counter planning and counter narratives is really interesting because it's not simply uh, you know, a black history or black resistance. It's, it's an amalgamation of different cultures in the valley 
Um, so they are drawing from these indigenous communities and their practices and combining them with their experience in this urban context. Um, so race is critical. Racial identity is important to our understanding of how uh, this process is, is uh, uh, developing in Cali. Uh, Alejandro? Hi, Professor Sarmiento. Nice to see you. Hey, Alejandro. Um, okay, so my question is uh, more general than that. It's like, did you, do you have a look at issues of mobilities, how this is linked to issues of mobilities in general, or have you thought about looking at them in the future? I don't know if you made that part of your research. Yeah, that's a good question. And, and you know, mobility, defined how, right? Because you can think of no, no mobility in, in, in the kind of obvious narrow sense of, you know, we're talking about transportation networks and access to various modes of transportation. Um, or you can think about residential mobility, right? More broadly. Um, and so I, I certainly have thought about uh, residential mobility. Um, and I, I think this is an interesting point because um, the, the kind of traditional mode of relocation um, in these projects is to offer a subsidy um, and then uh, use that subsidy um, to finance the construction of social housing. Um, where that social housing is constructed, you know, that is not, that's determined by the city, that's determined by land values, uh, the distribution of, of land values across the city, by the real estate industry essentially. Um, so they are being relocated, but None of that is alleviating uh, the spatial, uh, the, the, re the restrictions that residents experience, the, the sense of powerlessness over their own mobility within the city. They're simply being taken from one place and placed in another, right? And so perhaps then um, that requires a, a rethinking of these subsidies. Um, and, you know, you, you do have alternatives such as these housing vouchers, which um, in a sense, empower residents to find housing on their own and in a sense, contribute to residential mobility, but it doesn't uh, remove the, the, the structural racism within the market. So uh, it requires a, a kind of deeper uh, a rethinking and reimagining of how these um, strategies might support residential mobility. Um, but I don't know if that answered your question. I mean, uh, I think that, as you know, uh, Colombia still in the process of, of kind of expanding and building their transportation networks. And a lot of these communities are beyond the reach of those networks. Um, and so it, it is a, a, an important question. I would love to keep talking with you about this, but uh, I'll let other people uh, ask questions. Thank you. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Um, hi, I had a question. Um, I was really interested in, in what you mentioned about um, some of these folks who are now at risk for climate displacement, also having been displaced from the Pacific Coast due to political and economic violence. And I was wondering if you could speak more to how these multiple serial experiences of displacement might affect their experience of, of potential um, relocation, climate-related displacement um, in Cali and um, how res residents are responding to it, um, how they're impacted by it, um, you know, how those two experiences might um, build upon and relate to one another. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I, um, the displacement from the Pacific Coast and from these conflict-prone regions um, is important. Uh, Colombia has the largest population of in, internally displaced peoples in, in Latin America and perhaps the world. Um, it is still recovering from a 50 year long civil conflict. Um, in some cases that conflict continues today. And certainly in certain regions of Colombia, it's more active, one of them being the Pacific coast, which is a, one of the least uh, sort of urbanized areas of Colombia. Um, so it's an important factor there um, in terms of contributing to the displacement of residents um, into uh, cities and urban centers. Um, in fact, a lot of residents talk about this as a, they, they use the term double displacement. They've been displaced twice. Um, 
Now, so that's that's one side of the story. The other side is that because it it, it is understood within this context of this long-term civil conflict, um, it, there are also opportunities that are created here. Um, that is that Col Colombia's constitution, for example, which was uh, written in 1991, um, reflects uh, some of the demands uh, placed on Colombia by this conflict. Um, so on paper, the constitution is very progressive and it includes um, progressive um, uh, stipulations such as the one that I mentioned here, um, the uh, legal recognition of ethnic minorities um, and the creation of uh, uh, sort of legal artifacts such as prior consultation of ethnic minority communities that are historically attached to certain territories. Um, these are all artifacts of this decades-long conflict. Um, it, it's it representing the demands uh, placed on Colombia by the conflict. And so um, in a sense, it's, you know, the, the, the conflict has both contributed to displacement, but through these legal artifacts has created opportunities uh, for the construction of new pathways um, that are uh, viable in the context of climate adaptation. Thank you. Uh, I think we have Taisha next. Hi, Professor Samiento. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. So um, you uh, mentioned a uh, very interesting thing about the use of term like capacity building in this process. So I always found it very interesting for the to hear the government officials in the Global South using such terms. And I wonder like where learn, they learn this from. So, um, you mentioned that like World Bank is also involved in this process. So I'm just wondering like how the climate change adaptation knowledge is produced in uh, Colombia and why they choose to use such like global development buzzword instead of local knowledge. Like who determines that? Yes, that, that's that's a, a, an important question and, and it's, it's a, a deep question, right? That, that implies a kind of critical engagement with uh, international development more broadly, right? Um, in this case, the Fondaptacion, uh, this national entity is, is a really interesting agency. Now, Fondaptacion translates to adaptation fund, right? And, um, and it's very much about climate change um, uh, adaptation. So just a quick note about the, that fund, it was created in 2012 in the aftermath of a series of winter storms that uh, destroyed a lot of infrastructure and housing across Colombia. Um, it was meant to be a temporary uh, agency uh, that would help rebuild uh, uh, infrastructure. Um, but in 2015, it, uh, it partnered with the World Bank um, to explore uh, new forms of adaptation, uh, new forms of resilient development. Um, and so since then, it's become a kind of art articulator of between kind of global international investment um, in Colombia and uh, through partnerships with local municipalities, uh, local projects like Plan Harion, like the one I've talked about today. Um, and as I mentioned before, it very much is at the center of what uh, some scholars call the resilience industrial complex, right? It's this, this complex that has emerged to disseminate the language of adaptation on a global scale, the language of resilience, of adaptive capacity. Um, and this builds on older, more established discourses in development of inclusion and capacity building. Um, so it, really, it very much represents a merger between these kind of new discourses that are emerging around the climate crisis and older, more established forms of development. Thank you. Um, we have a question for Ranjini. Um, hi, Professor Sarmiento. Thank you so much for your um, presentation. So I had a question regarding, um, I think your previous comment on how the Colombian constitution uh, recognizes uh, ethnic minorities and also recognizes their territorial claims. I was just wondering whether you have noticed some um, 
maybe examples where you know the recognition of these territorial claims is actually being reproduced in a way in which the um, ethnic minorities are now uh, having to place claims on risky landscapes. So there is a reproduction of risk through um, these kind of territorial claims and racialization. If I hope my question is coherent. Okay, so the, the, just to be clear, the question is, um, um, uh, can you just re restate the question? Is it about uh, the, uh, communities um, seeing this as an opportunity to gain a certain um, legal recognitions and perhaps access to resources that um, they otherwise would not have? Um, is, is that the question? Uh, I think my question is whether, um, you know, in recognizing the territorial claims of communities, is there a reproduction of risk in a sense? Uh, because often like racialization works in, you know, fixing territorial claims of communities, maybe when they, once they're dispossessed in new landscapes of risk. So uh, have you noticed any such examples in your, during your study? Yeah. So one thing there that there's a lot of interesting uh, questions there around um, th this type of recognition um, and how um, the city and, and this national entity have responded. Um, I mentioned at the end um, this idea, um, this, this kind of uh, strategy they've created um, around stewardship of uh, the levy and flood protection system, uh, which they call guardians of the levy. Um, and this is really interesting because it's it's a and essentially it's a <laughs> they're co-opting the language that uh, emerged from residents and from the communities themselves um, to create these new forms of, of governance. Um, um, now, there's an opportunity there to either think of it as a point of entry, as as a potential uh, for residents to uh, join the conversation um, and to center their demands. Um, or as a form of social control, as a form of simply creating new vehicles, um, new uh, sort of techniques uh, for control over these territories. Um, so there is this kind of uh, two, two dimensions to this and two potential pathways that you can go with. Um, so there is that. Um, um, uh, in, in terms of, you know, whether it's actually contributing to um, displacing residents into risk areas. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a more difficult question because you're dealing with peri-urban uh, areas of the city, right? Peripheral areas of the city where kind of boundaries are unclear. Um, and so you do have um, rural communities that have been absorbed by the expanding sort of urban process. Um, and you know, they, they might make claims on being, uh, having certain uh, legal rights, certain territorial rights on the basis of kind of a historical attachment to their land um, and, and, you know, land that is, that is vulnerable to, to flooding. So that, that may happen as well. Um, Thank you. Um, do we still have any more questions from the audience? Alejandro, do you have any follow-up questions from earlier? Question, comment, can you, I mean, so the thing is that it's actually the, the way I, I do work on mobility justice and it has elements of race and, you know, like you look at elements of identity and how that creates questions, issues of mobility that go beyond the accessibility. Um, and so I guess that if I have a question is because you, usually when they do this and if they, they create displacement, they put the people in these places and then they don't really give them ways of moving around and access, it creates issues of accessibility. So there are, and all of the, so, you know, there's like the land that is linked to the policies of mobility that is all wrapped up in those discourses of sustainability and resilience that, uh, Hugo is mentioning. So if I have any question, it, like it would be a, about that, like how do you 
untangle that mess and how do you make people, the policymakers, uh, conscious of this and how do you like empower communities to help them go through these processes? It's a very broad question. Which I certainly don't have an answer for. <laughs> But it's a, it's a good question. Um, I see that we have a question in the chat from Bernadette. Um, I have a meta question from how you in introduce the talk what would it take to make the global discourse of adaptation less uh, hegemonic, or should we care? I, I see that it's a, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, and I take it as a, a rhetorical question. <laughs> I don't think I have an answer for that either. Um, I, but you know, I, I will say one. I do have a response to to that question. I, uh, in a sense, I I think one of the things that's important here is who narrates the climate crisis, who defines the problem, right? So even before we enter a discussion of adaptation and resilience, um, what is the crisis? Um, and um, and I think that that is an important uh, uh, an important starting point, right? Um, today, the the debate around the climate crisis, the the policy debates at the conference of the parties, you know, mo most most recently in stock uh, in uh, Glasgow, most recently, um, and uh, and here in the U.S., it's, you know, reflected in in the most recent um, uh, infrastructure uh, bill, um, who. Who is part of those conversations? Who's who's defining what should be the priorities uh, in terms of um, responding to this crisis? So I think that's the first place you start, um, and I think I think that then helps you address this bigger question of um, adaptation as a hegemonic discourse and its kind of hegemonic nature. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Um, we also have a question from Matthew, uh, Matthew Shore in the chat. Um, so the question asks, as you know, many people, including Afro-Colombians in Cali, Colombia, participated in protests against Colombia president and national government last year. It was seen by many to be a historic mo moment. Do you see that uh, as a pivotal moment for Afro-Colombians in Cali? And do you know how the stakeholders that you mentioned view the upcoming elections in Colombia this year? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That that was a, a very important uh, event. Um, I, I I see others here on, on the call who might know more about it. I'm, I'm looking at Alejandro and uh, others. Um, but th this was this was a historic moment. This was a historic moment in Colombia and in Cali in particular. Uh, Cali was uh, one of the principal sites of conflict, um, as it often tends to be. Um, but one of the more interesting events that took place during these protests was um, the participation of indigenous communities from the surrounding rural areas um, and, and their sort of um, the, the kind of alliances that they built with um, residents of these informal settlements who tend to be uh, where, where you have higher proportions of, of Afro-Colombian residents. Um, so, you know, in terms of just uh, bringing together these different sort of um, groups of people um, um, that I think was an important moment. Um, it, it helped establish certain alliances um, uh, or strengthen them um, in a way that hasn't happened um, historically. So um, I think that was important in that sense. I, I don't know how they view the upcoming elections. Um, I, I do know that um, um, one of the main, the, one of the candidates, one of the, the fav favored candidates, uh, Gustavo Petro, um, is a uh, former mayor of Bogota. Um, and um, during his time as mayor of Bogota, 
Um, his administration was very instrumental in uh, placing climate adaptation on the development agenda. Um, they, they invested tremendously in the idea of adaptation and specifically in this relocation strategy in the city um, in, in what they called a plan, a four-year plan called Bogotá Humana. Um, and so it, you know, I, I think there's perhaps a question there about is Bogotá Humana and the emphasis on resilience and adaptation found in that plan, is that going to be nationalized? Is that going to um, be reflected in a national platform um, if Gustavo Petro wins? But I, I don't know how the residents of Cali view this. Um, um, and maybe others on the call do. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? Um, if not, maybe we can take a wrap here. Um, and on behalf of GSAP and the urban planning program in particular, I'd like to thank you again, Professor Sarmiento, for your inspirational presentation today. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your work with us. Um, and thanks to also everyone who has attended. Our next LIPS talk will be next Tuesday at the same time by Professor Makal Kumar, whose talk will be on disassembling coal, finance capital, land, and environmental justice in South India. Thank you. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Hi. Nice to see you all. Bye. Bye.